So we just heard a lot about pigs and a lot about how they're raised and a lot about, you know, like kind of the process that goes through on that side of things. And then can you tell everybody, you well, your name too, since I already know, but sure. what you do. Sure. My name's Laura Green. Um, and I, uh, well, actually how Jordan and I have split up the farm is if the animal's alive, it's his problem. If they're dead, they're my problem. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, so um, I deal with everything for marketing, uh, direct to consumer marketing okay. um, for our farm. So you've gone through, a, I mean, and to be very fair too, this is something that I think it gets underrepresented in a lot of farm conversations and stuff like that too. But yeah, I mean, there, there's the whole process of raising it, getting everything set. And then there's the whole processing distribution, like this other back half that's almost, as, <laughs> it is sometimes like. Well, you can't raise the pig unless you have the money that comes back in, right? So right. you have to sell it or, you know. Make the loop. Yeah, make the loop or it's not happening. So in, in, in a lot of the practices and a lot of things that you end up doing in your side of things too, is mostly direct to consumer or wholesale? Direct to consumer. Okay, and then why do you go down that route? Um, really, it's just where my passion lies. Like, I absolutely love food. I, I love um, feeding it to my family. And I want to see that exact same thing getting into the hands of family like ours. Um, and I love relationships and being with people. And that looks like getting to meet our customers. Yeah. Um, rather than, you know, selling wholesale, it's, it's fine and dandy. Um, but it's, it's missing a, a, a part of it for me. Yeah, and the relationship too, and there's more <laughs> yeah. than one way that you get value back too. I mean, there's the monetary transaction too, but then right. there's that, yeah, the, the relational transaction too. So in terms of a lot of the products that you guys have, and this is for all of them too, right? Now, like uh, everything kind of goes into, you guys do CSAs? Uh, no. No, but you do individual items all bought on the store, online. Right. And then in general too, you have regular customers that show up to the farm. Yes. Right, because you guys have a whole store. Like, and is it yeah, we have store? a store. We yeah, we have a farm store. Yeah. Um, there on the farm, glass front freezers. You can come in and shop. Um, I think that's one of my favorite Tinder profile pictures I have. <laughs> one picture you took where I'm standing with my camera in front of it. It says country store. Nice. So oh, sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up, but like I just it, I remember that photo. That's okay. A great one. <laughs> so so that's been up and running though too. What other locations do you then distribute to? Um, there's a couple other places around our area. Um, they, they might be uh, produce actually stands um, that also offer our proteins um, that are in the area. And then we do drop sites throughout the Virginia area, Northern Virginia, Tidewater, um, Charlottesville, Richmond. Yeah. And you got Food Hub too? Uh, no. Oh, uh, for 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 P yeah. foods, yes. Oh, yes. That's a food hub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, I was sitting there. I was like, I swear, I got stuff reasonable, but <laughs> if they're just stealing it and repackaging, I'll tell somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so so kind of like a whole different area too. And then I I think that there is something really weird things happened during COVID, right? Sourdough bread all of a sudden took off. People were trying to buy individual cows for their milk. Like I was getting very weird questions. Um, what was your guys' journey through COVID in terms of that, like distribution, that back end? Um, definitely, you know, you go to sleep one night and you wake up the next night and you're like, wow, 100 orders, you know, came through like this, you know, like oh, they were shot. just coming in um, nonstop and you go from, wow, I thought I had my bases covered for the amount of orders, you know, yeah. that would be um delivered personally or shipped out um and overnight it went from you know maybe two handfuls of of shipping boxes to go to 100 wow. shipping boxes per week it, it stepped it up yeah um quite a notch okay and then in terms of the things that you guys were i mean were you getting orders that then pivoted to like can i get a half animal and like that. we definitely moved the half animals um but i would just say so many people were just looking to stock the freezer right away yeah um and so it was just anything and everything that you had on your shelf is going to be ordered yeah. until you tell me it's sold out and then where has that journey gone since covid too though i mean has it has it kind of like balanced out or i would say mostly it has balanced out um we we have still it's it's been cool some of the people that have you know came and found us during the 2020 um they've stayed around yeah. um which is really great to see others they they left as quickly as they came yeah um and they went back to the grocery store because they they now have food again right um yeah. okay. but but it has been great to see some of the some of the people who have stuck around and continued to support our farm and so we have continued to grow 
um, every year just with them sticking around and supporting us and um, guess they decided they liked us enough. <laughs> so you, yeah. That's, well, that's what I was saying. I mean, it's the worst thing I could have ever said, but I remember saying it where I was like, God, if, if the, like the, the heavy point of COVID lasted just a little bit longer. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I, that was me being my optimism. You know, the whole world was shutting down everything. People were like, you know, it's so, and it just, it, most of it was the mentality of staying out of that. And I was finding these silver linings, I feel like all over the place. Mm. People were, oh, for at least like two months, people were treating servers, you know, like not like servants, which was really nice at restaurants. And they're like, thank you so much for coming. And then it just all goes back. And the same thing with farming though, a lot of people were just buying direct to consumer and, and getting to understand more too, the whole the process mm -hmm. and too. And same thing, like, oh, I want some now, you know, like, well, it's not like strawberries. Aren't cows always in the season? It was like, well, yeah, but we only slaughter them so often. Like it's not every day. Um, for you guys too, that's something that I've, I've I've learned a lot about though too. But what is the process? You said when it's alive, it's his problem. When it's dead, it's your problem. But who does processing? Um, so it. so he, he brings them. You know, normally he drives the truck. You know, sometimes I will. But <laughs> um, but once it's at the butcher, um, I'm deciding doing the cut sheets. I'm deciding what how it all needs to be broken down. If if I've sold it you know, a half or a whole beef, um, putting those people's names, getting what their cut preference is on um, and filling out those cut sheets and getting that to the butcher. Okay. Um, yeah. So how picky are people about the types of cuts that they're, they're getting? Um, many times it feels for someone who's never purchased a half animal or a whole animal. Yeah. It, it's kind they're like, so it's like, are you going to drop a whole animal on my front porch? Like, what's going on? How does it show it's up? It's a good question, <laughs> right? Sorry, I'm serious. Um, How does it show up? But so what I have found is making sure that I walk through every step of the way yeah. and making sure that they understand, hey, you know what? If if you've never gotten a half a cow before, I have a form and here is the standard cut. So you can get boneless cut mm -hmm. or you can get bone and cut. And this is kind of, this is kind of the standard of what people ask for. Yeah. And this is what you can get out of it. So choose one of these options. We'll make it simple. If you want to go and you really know your cuts and you kind of understand how it goes, then right. fill out the custom portion of this and we'll cut it to what you want it to be cut to within reason of what our butcher will do for us. Right. Um, so you have the butcher, you also have the slaughterhouse. So for any animal that's above the size of it, chicken, right, or can turkeys be processed on property? Um, yeah, we do our poultry on farm. Okay, so poultry is allowed, mm -hmm. but just for folks- It's the that red too. meat. Yeah, so yeah. Any, anything, okay, so mm -hmm. anything with four legs? Yeah. I don't know, you can do rabbits, right? No? Um, I think you do rabbits on the farm. People, yeah. yeah, but so, so anything that's larger though, you have to take to a facility that is uh, USDA approved, right? USDA process if you want to resell it by the package. Oh, okay, package. So for yeah. whole animal, do you need to do that? You can do a custom processing who does not have a USDA label, but you have to have already sold it to the customer and it's their name that's going to the processor. To those. Now, I would not be able to say, you know, you wanted to buy a cow from me, I can't go process it on my farm without any inspection, because then that would be illegal in Virginia. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And then in terms of, you know, like what people are getting then afterwards too, like, so the the butchers that you're mentioning too, it, you sound like you're great to work with. If I wanted to call and like, you'd sure. like, what do you want? Is it that easy with the butchers too? Like, is it that a a a adaptable too? Or could somebody get uh, an animal and then say same thing, like hit up their butcher and ask them to do that? Or is it something that it becomes much easier processing through them? Um, so, I choose to work with our processor and make sure that if I if I have 10 cows going to the butcher mm -hmm. um, and say I've sold 20 halves, I'm going to deal with all of the customers and streamline the process because one thing with butchers is, you know, they understand all the lingos like and the cuts and everything else. And if you don't quite know their language and you think you've just asked for something and you've gotten something completely different. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I want all ground beef. 
you know, I, I want to get all the ground beef I can get and, you know, may, say that half a cow comes back and it's all ground beef. Right. But I didn't get the value because I didn't get the steaks. I didn't get the roast. Right. Well, what did you ask him for? Well, I asked him for all the ground beef. Well, yeah, I, you know, like all. <laughs> also, I'm starting to think, too, that butchers probably aren't great with people. I mean, the ones I know in different areas around here, they are wonderful. Like to go Oh, that's awesome. To. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I'm trying to think back too. is like, no, they're just spending all day cutting up meat. Like they're just sitting there, like, just tell me exactly what you want. Like, you sure, know what I mean? So, sure. so, so, you know, there, I think there's probably some of that in there too. Um, and then is this, is it the same relationship that most of the other farms that you guys know too, um, that they have this too? There's, I mean, I know for our area, it, there's always been conversations of kind of like shortage of slaughterhouses. It usually seems like there's a backlog at bit. Yeah. Butcher for butchers. Um, is that kind of the experience that you guys have or? For sure. I mean, before COVID, um, we were, we were putting dates on the calendar three, six, maybe six months in advance yeah. um, to get our animals butchered. Not a problem. You know, you could kind of run with what's coming up for your animals and knowing what sizes they were. Um, at the height of COVID, um, we were and still are um, reserving two years in advance and still not get at, like getting the dates that we need for our local one. Um, so we cool. actually have been driving over the mountain to Pennsylvania to get all of the pork and some of the beef done in order to get the amount processed that we need to have processed. And why to you is it that there is such a shortage of facilities? It seems to be that you have to be a multimillionaire in order to start up a USDA facility. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and it's yeah. complicated. You can either pick a, a USDA certified slaughterhouse or... Uh, uh, a vineyard as a dive bar right yeah, two two. <laughs> absolutely yeah 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 i get that one. i guess there's more fun ways to go spend your money yeah. and you're, you get to argue for a living if you, maybe <laughs> God. so there's a kind of a backlog on that end too and this is mostly affecting though because i i found that these large you know the the robust very large operations they kind of have their own slaughterhouses inherent like seems to be yeah, yeah. In different areas yeah in different areas though too and I'd, I'd film that stuff in maryland and other areas too um but I, so this is mostly how it affecting smaller farms is that mm -hmm. yeah ones yes absolutely yeah. and just ones that you know we're kind of in that middle ground of like we're probably big enough to start our own yeah um but is our passion really there yeah um at the same time and do we have the money to throw at it and uh, you know are there it's a there's number. a whole different there's a lot of different pieces that come into place to start it yeah um and so is it there yeah um yeah which is a lot but like you were saying though too so you've had most of the time though you, you know you're going over the mountains now it's a little bit further though but getting these things processed then they come back to the farm what is that journey like because i've always found um and if you know about this too because i don't know as much about this but what's the journey my meat goes on that's in the grocery store versus the, the journey that meat goes on when it's coming from a farm like yours um potentially similar um i'm i'm not exactly sure because i haven't fully um tracked you know me right yeah, right that. like i, uh, I worked at a grocery store going you know like oh, it was like okay. my first job you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but i was a bagger okay fair. um but um I, I would say it probably surprises many people of some of the things that happens of you know you have some of this meat that is fresh never frozen right. but yet it can still be at 32 degrees and that's con still considered fresh um, uh, um because it has to be below another certain temperature in order to actually be yeah, considered frozen, frozen. Oh, um and so you can also have some of the meat that is in the fresh case that has already been frozen they've thawed it to be fresh yeah um and then you know you go home and you freeze it right um you know, that is some is, of the normal is things. Because it, it's something I've always been taught, and this would be a great time to ask, probably should have asked you beforehand, but what the hey. Um, when I get meat, I've always been taught you can only thaw it once. Sure. Right? Wrong? <laughs> I I mean, USDA standards, there might be some things out there. I w yeah. It's kind of one of those things, you're going to lose a little bit of the integrity probably of the yeah, meat itself the and you know the the some of the nutrition that is there right um i'm not fully 
against necessarily like if I wanted to thaw a whole chicken, right. cut up four parts and then freeze and then it, freeze it. Okay. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just always do that thing. You know, when you're like buying something or whatever it is and you bring Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And then you're like, ah, oh, that puppy's sweating. Nope. All right. It's already good. You know what I mean? Like, sure. I see it that way where it's like, you can't go back to the ice age. Um, right. So good to know. Yeah. Uh, but, but then in, in terms of foremost folks, that, that journey though, that meat is taking that's frozen or like in terms of the shelf life, because that's something I know we talk about sometimes with produce, right? That, uh, you know, in the grocery side of things too, never terrible, but it's taking so long to get to you from when it's picked to, it, it changes that cycle of the food and the nutrient density. Is any of that comparable to meats and, and on the back half of there? You know, it's interesting. One of the questions that kind of actually bugs me mm -hmm. um, that a customer will walk in. Bad and, question. And yeah, you know, I, I would say it's more of an ignorant question. Yeah. Um, and I love to educate at the same time. So it's probably good that they're asking if they want to hear the answer. Yeah. Um, and that is, how long ago did this meat get butchered? Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's, you think that it's a good question. Sure. Because um, every meat that you buy says best buy. Well, some of them do, yeah. some of them don't. It, it depends on the processor and what they're putting on the labels. Yeah. Um, but from from my standpoint and knowing how the animal has been raised, a better question would be, how was this animal raised? Yeah. Because what you're really wanting to know is, is there nutrition in this meat? Yeah. Right? I, I get what you're saying, and people think that if I just, if, if it's it, it fresh for a year, yeah. Yeah, but if, so if it's fresh butchered, like, oh, it was so good because it was fresh butchered, you know, right? Interesting. Um, but once it's been frozen, you kind of seal, lock in yeah. all that nutrition, right? So, so I would take a five year frozen ground, grass fed ground beef yeah. any day over fresh one day conventional, be yeah. you know, ground beef because where's the nutrition lie? So we can totally flip that though to, like there is one better question that you can ask as opposed to, <laughs> <laughs> just don't ask if it's fresh meat. But, but that is something though that I think people do get curious about. And same thing, I'm always curious about with um, stuff in the store, just because it never tells you that. I would like to see like slaughter date. Mm -hmm. Does it? I don't think it does on any label. Um, I'm thinking well, about mainstream grocery stores like. I don't think most of them have that. It's yeah. normally like what you said, a best buy or best yeah. freeze buy. Because um, well, also most people do have this concept, like younger audiences though, right? That like, it just popped up like that in the grocery store. Like, sure. you know, that it, the, the, the animal, the, the living entity thing is, is disassociated from that too. Um, when you guys have done like either half or whole animal though too, do you find that a lot of the customers learn something about it? They're like, like they get cuts that they're like, what is this? What do I? Sure. Um, perhaps in some ways, but I also want to make sure that it is a good experience and they're not getting stuck with cuts that they wouldn't oh, necessarily sure, yeah. know what to do with. And so generally speaking, I, for our boneless or our bone in um, portfolio of yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, cuts, I'm going to keep it within the very normal cut. So, you know, beef, it's going to be the sirloin tip and the top round and the London broil, but I'm going to go ahead and throw bottom round into kebabs, Yeah, uh, yeah you know, or, or different things. Um, Are those considered value add, pro like ground beef? Is that like a um, I mean, it's probably not value add. I would say if it's if it's if it's moved into say beef sausage, yeah, you know, then it would be um, you know, for the pork. You're talking about yeah. smoked bacon and smoked hocks, smoked ham. Um, those would be a little bit more value add. Okay, so speaking of those, I I, I did find this fascinating after getting uh, wait by way too many sausages and cooking them, <laughs> but um, what's the relationship between the the the, the farmer? the butcher and the sausage at the end. Like who's making the creative calls there? Oh man. Um, well, you are, li you're definitely limited to what the butcher is willing to cut okay. and what seasonings that they have that you're allowed to choose from. You're from their standards out there for seasonings. And so you can't be like, you know, here's my seasoning. I would like you to put this in my sausage. Yeah. They, you can't do that. You can't or they no. won't? Um, 
I've I've yet to see it done. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I don't know. Like, because um, like if I figured out a partnership or a butcher, and I have to ask them their perspective too. Of like, what, yeah, you know, because it has to be a consistent. It has to be approved by yeah. someone, and I forget there there's some there's someone that it has to get approved by for seasonings. I just don't know who that is. Oh, um, so I should I do, probably I the same names ever. I was like, why does everyone like? Sweet Italian, like nobody actually can tell me what's in a sweet Italian. I, I you may be able to, but I'm just sure. saying normally, absolutely, people can't tell you what's in a sweet Italian. But like everyone, you and then I'm like, how did that climb the, you know, to get to where like you'll see those everywhere? But then there's other forms of it too, where yeah, you can't even describe what it is, even if they put it in there too. So you do you have control over the names of the products that you have if, when they're value add like that? Uh, no, they have specifically, they have to call it something, abide by rules. Um, yeah. so they have to say, um, they actually have to put like pork tenderloin rather than pork fish loin. They, like our processor for a while was using huh. pork fish loin. Cause you know, a lot of people knew it by that, but that wasn't legally. Really? Um, yeah. So you, they had to change it over to pork tenderloin. Um, so there, there is standards that you have to go by. I know, but um, weird. Like, what's the difference between a bratwurst, a sausage, and a oh, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Kielbasa. No, that one's definitely different. Okay. But there's, but anyways, and, and I remember asking you like, like, why'd you call it a bratwurst, not a sausage? Because technically, a bratwurst is something that yeah, and then like, do those names get interchanged a lot? Or is it... I mean, a bratwurst is just a, a, a just a seasoning for a sausage. Right. So. But they uh, had it with like it was different seasoning. They were still calling it a bratwurst. Anyway. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I okay. think it's just more like the colloquialism has kind of tied. You know, it's but like, I but I would have to say going back to your point though about this relationship, farmer, yeah, butcher, um, customer, right? Is that if you don't have a good relationship with a butcher, yeah, um, you're kind of smoked because. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Um, well, you know, you especially with this whole thing of small scale raising these animals out on pasture. You know, yeah. you you put your heart and soul into doing all of this for the meat. Yeah. And unless you have a processor that is going to do it well, they're going to say put it into packages that actually look nice. They're actually going to cut it the way that you ask them to cut it. Um, I mean. We've gone through many different processors yeah. over the years and had different experiences over the years. Oh, tell me about a bad one. What's like a <laughs> botched butcher? What does that look like? I mean, what does that show up from the from the, from the farmer's perspective, though? Of like, well, meat's all just meat in different packaging, right? Well, sure, it could be that we filled out a cut sheet and it comes back completely different. Oh, um, so you know, one would be: Do you have any MSG? in the seasoning yeah you know and they're like oh no we don't um it was actually our very first big that we had processed and they're like no we don't back. and we got it back and but it doesn't say msg right because yeah. the actual wording for msg is so much longer yeah. i don't think they understood <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know what it was. <laughs> like what it actually was so so our entire pig that we first got back actually had MSG seasonings and we're like, don't. <laughs> yeah, but that's, I'd still eat that though. I remember reading a whole book on MSG. It was like, it, it, it got known for the wrong reasons for being this bad thing. Sure. And we put it on everything though, but it's still one of those things that last too in the food culture. Right. Of like, you still want to see that it's not. Well, I mean, but some people have adverse, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, from it, um, adverse reactions, yeah. um, changes moods and gives headaches or, you know, different things. Yep. And so it was just kind of one of those moments of going, wow, yeah. okay, um, it really does make it or break it. If, if you have a good relationship with the butcher and you kind of know what's going on versus, and, and we've just, we've been through many different ones and have had our ups and downs. And, yeah. you know, it's okay if a butcher messes up because we're all human. I've messed up so many times. Sure. Um, but it's, what do they do to fix it? And is this going to be a oh, repeat oh, problem? I'm going to be like, no, sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, sometimes, right? Well, they just told us they'd super glue it back together and recut it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, now, talking about some of these things, too, in terms of, we, we talked a little bit, too, uh, with Jordan about uh, uh, pigs, pork, all these kind of fun products, too. Um, I, I've always found it very interesting what Virginia, it, when you have an area tied to an object in certain ways, right? So you have Virginia ham. 
Um, what is that? And does it still exist? <laughs> or is it just pigs from Virginia? Um, I mean, I think it's the curing process, right? That's what I had learned about. Yeah. I mean, it's illegal now, but you still have Virginia ham. Right, right. Is kind of the thing. But do you guys ever get asked about that too? Like that it's special because it's ham from Virginia? I, I don't, but no. maybe I should market it that way. Well, I've been <laughs> I've been wondering about that because same thing. You, yeah, you can't do Virginia ham, but this whole area was known for that. Sure. And like, you know, even on different farms, you'll see smoke houses that were just built, literally buildings that were just built just to slow cook. And yeah, mm-hmm. the curing process, which the minute that the USDA got in, Created, sure. You know, I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing, right? Yeah. Like USDA, you know, we're hopefully not killing people anymore, um, yeah. right? Like that's that's a good thing. Up to um, the layer of the jungle, it's good and time. and sometimes it's you know an overbearing protective parent that yeah. you're just like get out. <laughs> well, are there any products though that you guys have been finding though that are tied to an area or anything unique that butchers will cut because you know like we we don't have a New York strip steak, right? Like we don't have a Virginia. Sure. But if we did, what would it be? What would you want it to be? Man, very interesting. Um, what cut sense Virginia or looks like the state? Right. I mean, the pigs are real. Like anything, pork is really great. I mean, I understand why like ham, right? Like, I mean, they did more smoked and everything, mm-hmm. but really sauce. Okay. Let me, let me back up here. It was interesting going to a processor in Pennsylvania and traveling so far because I was asking them for seasonings that they didn't have. And I was like, no, I want these seasonings. And they were like, that's not popular in our area. Like, let they didn't quite understand. And so I actually ended up, they... I apparently introduced them to new seasonings than they had ever like discovered before. Uh, And so they ended up revamping their seasonings over the course of time and being like, well, we just decided to go with ones that you like. This is a good (laughs) point though, but are different state laws different? So like if I did want to go make a different type of sausage uh, and work with a, a, a butcher in another state, could, can that, I just, I just, I found it fascinating. There's like, it seems like this short list menu of like, types of sausages and i've seen some other ones too that have kind of like popped up but i just find that you know it it's one of the hardest things to sell is ground meat and we're not doing a lot of like pepsi coke kind of like blind taste challenges of like this is conventional Mm -hmm. here's the other ground meat so like the only way to really sell that stuff well is you package it sausages Sure. Right. So like these other ingredients though, but are, is it something that if you go to a different state or different areas, like in Virginia is like, you can only make these types of sausages. It's not necessarily that, but I think what you're finding is these are the popular kinds. And there's a reason that all of these processors and farms go might be it. carrying these sausages is because they're actually popular in our area. Okay. And people you so go what, with what, what are, works. What are the most popular ones in this area? What are people? Um, praying? so our top sellers are definitely the breakfast, um, which has sage in it. Yeah. Um, the uh, little ones. That, uh, well, I mean, little, but any of the, the, yeah, yeah. the loose, I mean, we do the loose links patties. Yeah. Um, uh, the mild. Att-